Today, I'm very happy to welcome Cassidy on our podcast as a guest. He's the VP of Marketing at Narrative Science. Uh, Cassidy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sammy. I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Me too. Where are you living, Cassidy? I actually live outside Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. So I live in a suburb. The suburb's called Wheaton. Um, it's about 30 miles west of Chicago, for those who've ever been to Chicago. And it's, I nice assume and cold, it's nice and cold here. I <laughs> assume it's, yeah, it's winter now. I assume you might even have some snow. We definitely have snow. We've had snow, I'd say for the past three weeks, we've had snow on the ground. Now it's kind of icy. And then every few days we get a little bit more. So mm -hmm. I'm waiting. I'm looking forward to it going away. Ah, so. Very good. Um, so what do you love to do outside of work? Yeah, well, not a lot these days because there's not a lot to do outside of work. Um, but we have three young kids that are nine, seven, and three. So most of my time outside of work is spent with them, um, whether that's, you know, in the past, shuttling them to, uh, you know, different activities or playing in the yard or doing whatever. So these days, how we make that uh, fun is we're outside either in snowball fights, building snowmen, or my son got laser tag for Christmas, which is a surprisingly fun game to play outside. So we'll get into laser <laughs> tag battles as well. So most of my time is occupied with my kids these days. Um, you know, pre-kids, I like to get out and do a lot of stuff. We, my wife and I traveled quite a bit. We actually lived in Spain for a while. Um, and that was all pre-kids. So I had a good, I had a good, uh, a very different life pre-kids as far as like activities go. But now with kids, most of my, my outside work activity is with kids. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, the the laser tech, I could assume, is like, that's a gift that a dad gives his son to have fun. <laughs> Did you give it or yeah, was yeah. it from someone else? Uh, it was actually my my mother. So their grandmother <laughs> got it for them. And I remember when they, op when they opened it, I'm like, that's just a brilliant idea. I'm not sure why I didn't think about it. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it worked surprisingly well. Um, like, it's up to like 500 500 feet or 500 meter range. I like guess a pretty big range that you can hit somebody with it. Longer than with the wife. A lot of fun. You that, should look into that, that Sammy. Cool. I will. I will. I don't have small <laughs> kids yet, but I can do it with my <laughs> with my friends. That's cool. Um, tell me about your good, company. Good team building exercise. Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, I we are remote. Good team building exercise. Yeah, definitely. But we are a remote working company. And right now, because of lockdown, we cannot get together at all. Um, so we're recording this in January 2021. So yeah, unfortunately not possible, but definitely, yeah, it doesn't hurt like paintball. So that's a good one. Definitely. I would try it. Exactly. Um, Cassidy, tell me about your company, Narrative Science. What are you doing? Yeah, so our company, um, our mission is pretty simple. We want to make sure, you know, we want to create a world where everybody can understand data. Um, we do that by, um, in a, in a fairly innovative way, our company started 10 years ago and was born out of, uh, research at a university called Northwestern university, which is outside Chicago. And simply at, at its simplest basis, what we do is we take data and we turn it into human language. So into stories, and you can think about it as we give the voice to your data. And we've done this in a variety of different ways over the last 10 years, but our latest product Lexio is a product that we're excited about because we believe it's the future of analytics. So, you know, there's a world today where all of us are looking at dashboards and charts and spreadsheets to kind of try to figure out our, our business going forward and what we should do to improve it. And we believe in the future where a machine will tell you what you need to know and they'll communicate that to you in a narrative or a story. So you can just read about your business versus trying to figure it out yourself. And so we've seen a lot of really good success with Lexio here early on. Um, still very early market, um, but we're excited about it. And the feedback we've gotten from um, our customers is exciting too. And being able to really for the first time empower everybody in a company to understand and act on data. Whereas before you needed somebody to explain that to you. Now the machine that does. That is true. That is really cool. So instead of, uh, it's like instead of reading a book, you, you hear a podcast. Now you can hear your data and story. I don't know if exactly. I get it right, but that's how I understood it. That's that's perfect. That's exactly right. And, you know, anytime you tell a story, you're really looking for three things. You want to know the narrative or the story. 
um, we also provide visuals, but the visuals are in the context of the story. So it's not like you're just reading only words. We'll put charts and graphs in there automatically. And, and really, I think the difference between kind of this generation of technology and maybe the past is we want to add the context. So, you know, Sammy, you're, you want to know something about your business that might be different than a, um, somebody else in your company. And, you know, the software should do that. It should be like, you know, Sammy needs to know this and we're going to give him this because that's what he cares about. Casty needs to know something else. So we're going to automatically tell him what he needs to know. And so it should be personalized and kind of con contextual to everybody in the company. And you can't do that today when you're building kind of predefined static dashboards you know, a mm -hmm. machine needs to do that at scale. And that's what we're working on. And that's what we think the future of analytics is. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Interesting product, definitely. And what is your job at Narrative Science? So I run marketing uh, for the team. And, you know, that can mean many different things in many companies, but for us, that means driving growth for the business. So very simply, when you're a small company, the marketing function needs to drive awareness for your, your company and what you do, um, create demand for your products, uh, and then work with the sales team and the customer success team to turn that demand into to revenue. And that's our objective, pretty simply, is to grow the business as a marketing function. And that's how we measure ourselves. And that's really the expectation of the company is that we're part of that engine that makes us successful. Mm -hmm. cool. What's the size of your company? We have about 100 people. Mm -hmm. And how big is the sales and or marketing team, roughly, so that we get so an idea? We have a commercial organization. In, in the commercial organization, it's marketing, sales, and customer success. And we are, um, I should know the answer. We're somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Split, I, I think, you know, roughly, yeah. split roughly evenly across marketing, sales, and customer success. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's important information because we were going to deep dive into how you build your team. So it's interesting to know at what stage you are right now um, yeah. and, and who will benefit from it. And I can tell you, um, I will definitely benefit from it. So that's why I put these questions in. Super oh, selfish, but I'm pretty sure that other people love it too. Um, I, the, I, one, one thing I want to add about this, so our marketing team, I would say for the size of company we are, we have a, a decent sized marketing team in and what, what's important for, I would say, maybe folks listening to this is that it, it, the size of your team in marketing and sales kind of depends on the motion that you're driving as a business. So for us, marketing, we, we want marketing to drive the majority of the demand. So a lot of like the pipeline we create and the revenue that comes from that pipeline is generated from marketing activity. Um, therefore, your marketing team might be slightly bigger than an organization that may say, hey, I'm going to build a big outbound sales function and I'm going to drive the majority of my demand through outbound, then obviously your marketing team will be smaller and your sales team will be bigger. So mm -hmm. um, the motion is important to kind of understand the context and the size of the team. And what we're trying to do now is, you know, really generate an inbound function where we're an inbound motion where we're creating the majority of the demand through the marketing function. Mm -hmm. And then and sales your... obviously converts that to mm -hmm. uh, revenue. Mm -hmm. um, who's your target customer? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, I'm going to answer this in a few ways. Uh, we are, there's kind of two ways to think about this. It's uh, analytics leaders in companies. Um, those companies tend to be a pretty wide range, but I would say the sweet spot for our current product is somewhere between, you know, 500 people in a company and 5,000. Um, we traditionally, if you think about the other products we have in our portfolio, we've always, we've started as a small company selling into large enterprises, which is unique, uh, for most small companies. So we've always kind of started in the enterprise market and that's what we know well. So, um, you know, larger mid market, smaller enterprise is where the sweet spot is for our current product. When it comes to the persona, we're looking really across, we kind of need a mix of two things in a company. We need a visionary leader. So an early adopter. Um, if you've ever read like crossing the chasm as a book, um, because what we're, what we're doing for what we're providing is something that's fundamentally different than the status quo. So we need somebody who's, um, got the confidence and kind of the vision to kind of drive that forward in their company. And then we need an analytics leader who is on board with that, that vision and, and that willingness to drive the change. And so two things happen in our 
go to market motion, we may hit the visionary leader first and then they pull in the analytics leader, or we may hit the analytics leader who then pulls in the visionary person in their company, or the analytics leader may be the visionary as well. So it's really this mix between, it's really top down. Um, we're looking for leader, senior leadership, looking to drive change tied into the analytics function in some way, if it's not coming out of the analytics function. Mm -hmm. so. Super interesting. We will deep dive a little bit later into how you do it in practice. Perfect. But first, I want to come to a totally different topic. That is, um, in the pre-interview, I found out that you have a unique way of building your sales and marketing team at Narrative Science. Um, can you give us a few examples um, or of, of people you hired or you put into certain positions um, that will showcase what I mean? Yeah, so I think what I surprised you with is um, I kind of rattle off our team. You know, the, the woman who runs growth for us, which is, um, which is brand and demand gen together, has never run, you know, demand gen before. Uh, our product marketing team has never done product marketing. Um, we have a designer in our team who never did design before. That was something she wanted to try and we let her try that. Um, we hired a woman to come in to do marketing operations and she never did marketing operations. We put her in a different role. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we don't, we aren't classically, you know, we don't have people in kind of classic positions. We didn't, we don't hire people have a lot of years in a function. We look um, for a different quality in people to build the team and, um, and we're very specific about what we look for. It just doesn't happen to be first and foremost um, experience in a function, if that makes any sense. And we can happy to elaborate on that. Well, we will elaborate on that one. Um, why don't you hire special specialists? Because I mean, you're not a super small company. You, you're not like a five people startup where everybody has to do everything. And you have the resources to, to buy specialists, so to say. Um, why don't you do that? Well, I mean, it's not like we don't look for people um, that have that cape. It's not like we're adverse to bringing in somebody who has experience in the function that we're hiring. It's just more important for us to find other attributes in a person. So we have a set of virtues as a company. Everybody, every company has this, but we actually live by them and then we hire to those virtues. And we spent a lot of time in the interview process, making sure that we found the right person that fits kind of the culture of the company Ideally, yes, that person would come with experience within the domain or the function that we're hiring. But oftentimes what we find is the best person in a function may not be the right fit for the company. And so it does take us a while to find people um, to, to kind of fit our culture. Um, so we're patient about that. And I would say the other thing that we've learned over time is we do a lot of self-promotion from it within. So we'll, we if we hire the right person, we bring them into the company, you know, part of that is the ability for that person to grow and learn and adapt. So a lot of the team is also built from within, giving people in our company an opportunity to try something different. And really part of the marketing team's made up, makeup is by just moving people around and getting them into the right position um, based on what we need to do and kind of their career interests. So it's not like we set out to purposely not hire uh, <laughs> for domain expertise. It just happens to be that sometimes the best candidate um, is not the person with the most experience. Yeah, you gave me this one example where you interviewed like people for a marketing position. And in the end, yeah. your intern got the job. Can you maybe quickly uh, <laughs> tell us this short story? Because I found it super interesting. Yeah, so the, the most recent hire we're looking for is somebody come in and run content marketing for us. And we had... Um, I would say we saw 300 resumes and we end up interviewing one person out of 300. And when we started talking as a team, the person we really wanted was the person who was still in undergraduate you know, college or university uh, who interned for us. And she'd been helping us out part-time. So um, we just felt like that, like we were trying to find somebody who was that person. And we kind of realized, listen, we, why don't we just go to see if she would be interested in joining us after she graduates? And then, you know, in the interim, you know, can she help us out until she graduates? And that's, and obviously she was excited about that and open to that opportunity. And that's the direction we ended up going. So it's one of those things when we find somebody who really fits our, 
our culture and our and kind of the makeup of the company, we don't want to let them go. We want to make sure that we recognize that and bring them in. And then we're confident we can develop that person and the person can develop themselves into the, the role that they're going to, to be in. And I think this is like, this is maybe something that people often overlook. And that is in a lot of ways, like what we're doing in a marketing function, is it rocket science? you can take really smart people with a lot of curiosity and drive and they can figure out how to get the job done. (laughs) It's hard to find people with the right level of curiosity and drive and kind of belief in kind of what you do as a company. So we look for those things first and then we're confident if we hire the right person, they're going to be able to figure out marketing or sales or whatever. Yeah, that's, that's like, hmm, that's already going into the next question I had in mind. So what qualities are you looking for? So one thing is curiosity. Um, yeah, so and- we, we have like these four virtues and I can elaborate on them. Um, mm-hmm. Like we're a very mission driven company. So if you think about like our mission to make everybody, you know, help everybody understand data. We want people passionate about what we do and and that's not everybody. We understand not everybody will be passionate about what we do as a company, but we feel like because of what we do, you have to be passionate about like the mission we're on. We want people, you know, we want, we have this thing called team first. So we want the person to be like, I'm going to do whatever it takes for the company. That's the team. That's the unit um, versus, you know, what's best for me. And, you know, a lot of people will say this, but we actually figured out how to hire for it. You know, and then the other two things that are like impactful innovative innovative is where curiosity sits you know um because of where we sit in the market as kind of a technology disruptor um you know we're trying to figure out you know the things we need to do there's no real playbook for them right um very few companies are actually truly disrupting a um you know a market or a segment and so we want to get people in here who are thinking outside the box who are you know, passionate about what we do, who put kind of the company first and then have an outsized impact when it comes to like their ability to innovate and drive results. And so if you do all that, we get find those people, which are really hard to find. Then we just, then it's all about just getting them into the right role where they can maximize, um, you know, their attributes. And, you know, we spent, you know, we'll move people around until we find the right role where they can create the, the most impact for us. And that's part of, that puts a lot of, more, there's a different type of stress on a system as far as like making sure from a development perspective, we're getting people in the right spot, but um, we've become pretty good at that. But it's also nice if, if you think about it from an employee, employee perspective, that if you, if it's not the right fit, it, it's not necessarily because you're not the right person for the company. It's not the right job within the company. And then you try to get the right job for the right person. So it kind of, gives you a long-term perspective within a company um, and enables you to keep the good people. So I, I like that notion. Yeah, I'll give you a good example of my team. There's a woman on my team who, who spends part of her time doing product marketing, which she's never done, and part of her time doing design for, for marketing, which she hasn't done. And before that, she was in professional services and, and she did fine there, but she wasn't as passionate about like the role and we knew it wasn't the best fit for her and it wasn't, she knew it wasn't the best fit for her as well, but she's a person we want in the company. And so like our job, and obviously the person's job is part of their career development and our job as part of management is to try to get them in the right position. And now we have her in this position, which on paper you would have never hired for. One, you would never put these two functions together. And two, if you were to somehow put these two functions together, you would, you would not be looking for somebody who had no experience in either. And she's crushing it in both aspects. And so, you know, that's part of like, we found people that fit our company. We've given them the opportunity. We obviously develop them um, and provide the tools to do that. But it's really the person and the person's kind of desired that that makes a difference. And so um, that to me is like a great success story that you would never, nobody in, you know, human resources would ever say that's a good idea. (laughs) <laughs> but Very unconventional. Be, yeah so yeah. it turned out for us to be a great idea um and we have a lot of those around th- throughout the company not just in marketing um in product and product development like if you look at our product management team 
Hey, you know, most of our product management team didn't have prior experience in product management. And, and they are the strongest product management team I've ever worked with. Um, so, you know, that's just, it's unique to our company, um, but we've, you know, managed to make it work. And um, I think it's made us stronger top to bottom in our company when you look at the, the people we have um, mm -hmm. because of it. Cool. Now, my question is, how do you how do you find the right people it's tough like um we've gotten really good think you know you know hats off to our kind of our you know put the the props go to our talent team and our human resources team we've gotten very good at hiring finding and hiring the people who fit our culture first and so interviewing for culture is something that's can be very difficult to do. And I, I think we do it really, really well. It's really one of the reasons I joined the company was um, not just that they said it, but you could feel it in the interview process. Like they were actually looking for people who fit the company first. And so we we do that. Um, can, can I ask yeah. a follow-up question on that point specifically? How do you like, how do you try to figure that one out in practice? Can you give an hands-on example how you do it in an interview process? Yeah, so we have four virtues. We have um, uh, a series of questions that we use to facilitate a conversation around each virtue that we'll do at different stages in the process. So we may sit down early on with recruiting and be like, we're looking for this role in this background. And we obviously want to know these certain things about their skill set. These one or two virtues are going to be the most important for you to 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 weed people out early on. And so the recruiting process and kind of the filtering will be looking for that right from the beginning. And so then you pass like a certain level of filter based on like your ability to adhere to the virtues. Then when we bring somebody in for an interview, we actually divide this up. So like we'll have three to four different people interview this person. Each person has a different virtue. And so, and there's a series of questions that we ask. We've gotten, we've gotten into a, a process where it's not ad hoc, it's repetitive. So, you know, if I'm interviewing, if I'm interviewing you, I might be, obviously I'm asking you all the types of questions you do in an interview, but what I'm really looking for is team first. And I'm going to report back out on that. And I'm going to give a thumbs up or thumbs down. If I feel like that person meets that virtue, the other people do the same. And so but it's not ad hoc. It's not like I get to, I'm just winging it and deciding what's team first. Like we'd go through training and what it means. We have questions you ask. We have a healthy dialogue um, in case somebody saw something different. And so that what happens when we get together and we talk about a candidate, 80% of the conversation is about cultural fit and 20% is about whether they functionally can do the job. And anybody in that discussion can say no. Mm -hmm. And if you say no, then the person's out. Mm -hmm. And so this has been obviously something the company's built and refined over time, but it was started a long time ago. Um, and we've gotten pretty good at it. You know, the flip side is it takes a long time to find somebody. <laughs> yeah. So like we, uh, you know, the woman we hired for marketing operations um, last year, we probably had that role open for over 12 months. Mm, yeah. But when you look at the person we brought in, she's outstanding. Like we, we didn't miss on that hire. Right. So. Um, and a wrong hire can cost you a lot. I mean, that is painful. Absolutely. Yeah. And so like, if you're not confident, this person is going to work out, you probably shouldn't make the decision. And so that's, mm. that's kind of the mentality we take into the process. Mm. I can maybe give a hands-on example for the audience that just popped up. We use it in our interview process to find out if someone is a team player. It's like we are not as structured as you are yet because we are really a young company. But um, what we ask is, for example, what what is the biggest accomplishment you can remember? And then we don't. It's not. I mean, we. I think we stole it from Google or some other company. <laughs> But what you look for is not the content, what they're saying, but are they talking about themselves as a person only, or are they talking about a team? You know, is it like a team effort? We want together, we did this. And you just count the V's and the I's, and then you get a good feeling if this is an I or a we person. Um, so this is the kind of question 
you likely can use in a structured way uh, to compare in the end. So I love that example. Um, I'll give it a, a, another anecdote, like our, our president, who's my boss, like he's very good in these interviews. Like he'll get into your background because what he wants to understand is like how you grew up and how motivated you are and what makes you tick and what kind of obstacles you've overcome in your life and will you give up easily or will you fight? And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really, it, it's really an interesting interview when he does it to you. He did it to me when I was getting hired, but then to watch him do it to others because he really wants to understand who you truly are and kind of like what's made you successful to this point. Um, and it's, it's, the, a lot of the conversation isn't about like what you've done on the job, but like you as a person and kind of what you've had to endure through, you know, your life to get to where you are. And so that, you know, again, nobody in human resources would uh, advise you to take that route of questioning, but you can learn a lot about somebody um, by going that route. Yeah, absolutely. It just reminded me of an interview I had with, with the CEO of HackerOne. And he said um, he's hiring for people like they're growing internationally. Um, and what he said, for example, for France, if I remember correctly, they hired a person from the UK to capture France. Because if you come into a new country, you live into a new country, you have to have grit already to learn the language, to, to get, get up, up running. And, um, and these are the people that usually thrive really well. And he said, this is like the the formula that they use if they enter a new country or a new region, they try to find someone from outside the region who's living there, who made it there in some way, and uh, try to get that person to capture the market. So I love uh, that example. Yeah, so it's, it's really I, I, interesting. Yeah. And I, I should also add to this, I like that. Um, like the company used, wasn't always that way. Like the company's been around for 10 years. It's been that way since I've joined, which was over two years ago. But early on in the company's history, and the CEO will admit this, like, they hired for credentials. Like, what school did you go to? How many degrees did you have? Because we were doing very pioneering things. So like, if you went to Harvard or, you know, MIT or the, the big universities in the United States, like, that's how, that gave you a huge leg up. You had an MBA from a prestigious school. And what happened was that created an awful culture. And so, you know, I give all the credit to the CEO and our, the, the leadership team and the you know, the founders who said, listen, this is not what we want to build as a company. And now like those things are nice, but those aren't, those things carry absolutely no weight, almost no weight um, when it comes to like how we evaluate people. I we've, like seen it. No, yeah. we've seen no evidence that, you know, that that makes a difference. Um, I think, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I think also that the big companies like Google who do a lot of data crunching of what works and what not, also came to a kind of similar conclusion that the kind of university you attended does not show how you will perform on the job and how you will develop. So that's that's really good. And it gives me some um, some rest because we are going exactly in the same direction. Um, and and um, yeah, it's nice that you see for, for us, you are already a bigger company with 100 people. We are only like counting our working students in 30 now. Um, but still, it's, it's, it's good to see that there are others out there who think are like, um, so now we go into, now we shift gears, we go away from HR and we go um, into the marketing uh, part of the, of the podcast. Um, a lot of marketers still focus on, on MQS. Um, what's your take on, on that one? Well, my take is like, that's the wrong thing to focus on. Um, so I think marketing, like any commercial organization should focus on generating revenue. Um, so obviously we look at that as a marketing team, but for us, because of, because of the motion we run, like the leading indicator to revenue is are we generating pipeline? And the reason I like pipeline as a metric is because marketers can't create pipeline themselves. The sales team creates the pipeline. They're the ones that put the opportunity into a system. And so and they obviously are doing that because they want to ensure that they can close those opportunities and turn them into revenue. So what I like about pipeline, it's it's the a good intersection between marketing and sales. It's not enough for marketing to say, I've generated good leads. If sales isn't converting those leads to pipeline or even getting on the call. 
And so when I showed up, like the first thing we did with the sales team is said, listen, this is what we want to be our unifying metric. If we're not creating more pipeline, then we have a problem. It could be, it could be a sales training and education problem, or it could be a marketing problem, but who cares as a team first company, we have a problem. We need to fix it. And so that's been very effective in, in steering kind of our priorities. And then from there, they cascade, obviously to get opportunities, you need good leads and good leads come from leads. And so it's not like we don't look at these things. We don't look at like, what do we consider a qualified lead? Um, but what we really first and foremost drive to is like, you know, are we creating pipeline? And if we're not, then what is the root cause for that? And those root causes may be lead quality. It may be sales follow-up. Um, you know, one we've seen in the past is the ability to get a lead to actually to a meeting, which marketers don't really think about too much. Like you got a lead. Could you get them on the phone? It's hard to get people on the phone these days. <laughs> so, you know, those conversion rates are important for marketers to understand because that's what leads to, you know, you can't open an opportunity until a salesperson has talked to somebody. And if the salesperson can't get the person on the phone, then that's a problem that you need to fix. And so um, that's how we think about it. Like we certainly have the notion of a qualified lead, but it's not marketing or sales qualified. It's just qualified by a set of criteria that we've agreed with the sales folks. And when that leads qualified, there's an expectation the salesperson is going to follow up in a certain amount of time and a certain number of, in a certain cadence. And we'll measure that follow-up and make sure that they're doing it as we agreed. Um, it just makes it much more simple than like, the cascading kind of, you know, MQL, nurture, nurture, nurture. Um, the other thing we do on this front, which might be interesting for your audience is we never pass a lead to sales if they haven't requested to talk to sales. And so think of that as requested demo on a, if you're building a product, it could be just requested demo button on your site. We do collect leads in other ways. We have events and we have a newsletter, we have a podcast and we don't really gate a lot of content, but if we gate content like our book, like we get leads, but those are leads that are part of our community that marketing markets to like, those aren't leads we pass to sales. Mm -hmm. Sales only gets the leads when somebody says, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to see your product and talk to a salesperson, which puts obviously more pressure on the marketing team. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so if I subscribe or if let, let's say I downloaded an ebook, so you have my email address and my name, what would happen? What would marketing do? Uh, well, we'd send you the book. Um, that is good. <laughs> that is a minimum requirement I would expect. Definitely. <laughs> we would, uh, so what we would do is we would evaluate, um, who you are, would you fit kind of our ICP? Mm -hmm. And how well, ICP is that? just just to clarify because maybe not everybody knows it. It's yeah. ideal customer profile. Correct. So, is this a person we would like to sell you something to, or are you just a fan of what we're doing, or you just wanted the book? And so, based on kind of who you are, we'll determine like how we um, engage you going forward. You know, an engagement going forward may be promotional emails, and maybe inviting you to an event. It may be showing you like, hey, have you seen our new product? Here's what it is and here's what it's about. But it's marketing's job to take the person who downloaded the ebook and get them to raise their hand to say, yeah, I would love to check out what you're doing and talk to somebody. And if they haven't raised their hand, then they're just part of our community. They're just part of people who've worked, you know, engaged us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like the term nurture because I don't want to think of it that way, but it's like really just more education, more relationship building. We do, we build a lot of content. We run a lot of events that are more about us just giving value to the audience versus not ask, you know, without asking something in return. This is all about building awareness of who we are. We assume if you're going to download an ebook or come to our event, you're going to look at what our company does. And if you find it valuable, you're going to say you want to you're smart enough now these days to figure out like how you get on the phone with somebody. We don't need to keep badgering the person. And we certainly don't need to waste our sales team's time doing it. People are sophisticated enough to know if I'm, if I think something that you're doing can value my company, then I'm going to do my research and I'm going to ask you to um, talk to me. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's kind of, you know, that, that creates some strain in marketing sometimes, uh, of course, because, you know, you might be generating a lot of engagement, a lot of interest, but we don't have that many people raising their hand to talk to us. That's not the sales team's fault. That's marketing's job. So <laughs> that puts more pressure on us to figure out what we need to be doing better um, to either target the right audience or create um, the urgency and the need for our products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on top, provide something that is of value. I mean, exactly. um, you have to really put yourself into the shoes of your ICP, so your ideal customer, and you maybe have different segments, and then you have to think about what do they really need and what would they value. So, I mean, and that starts with coming up with the right ebook. And that would be my question How do you come up with the right ebook? Well, first of all, we, we don't do many ebooks. Um, or, or, or whatever, like, yeah. kind of content that you use as a gated content so that someone has to give them give you um, the, the contact details. So there's a, we have this notion of, uh, and I didn't coin this word, word some, uh, an agency in the US did, but I quite like it. It's called content-based networking. And so what we'll do is we want to engage other people in our community who are thought leaders in, let's say, analytics, because that's what we're focused on. And um, use their content and kind of their expertise to create value for our audience. And so there's a few ways we do this. We've gotten good at running virtual events and kind of innovating on those. So we ran, you know, before COVID, we had no, I, we had no strategy to run virtual events. We ran three of them last year. We have our fourth one coming up. They're all different. You know, we try, you know, we learn from each one and we do something different going forward. And in these events, these events aren't about like, come buy our products. These aren't like a customer user conference. These are events about people driving change in data and analytics. These are about like um, a new way to do marketing. And so what we do is we invite these thought leaders to share their expertise to our audience. Um, and so that's one way we provide value. And can because we we're the dive, Can we deep dive, sorry to interrupt you. Can, you, can yeah. we deep dive here because I'm curious how such an event looks like do you have like I, I understand you invite like thought leaders or people who can bring value to your community or to the potential buyers so that potential buyers basically say hey i can learn something from that uh, person or that audience and uh, not audience to uh, from that speaker but um is it like a panel is it like can you can you go a little bit into detail how how i can envision such a virtual event yeah sorry if you hear the dog in the background um it's a combination of things. So uh, the the first few events were either one day or two day, and they'd be a mix of kind of uh, keynote, a mix of like interviews, so think of podcasts, but live during the event, and a mix of panels. Um, and so that was kind of, it was kind of very traditional in that, that sense for the first three of them. And we would mix up formats between the three and number of days and length and we had to figure out how to like shorten them so they're not so long and everything that we had create live would go on demand because we know people aren't going to sit in front of zoom for an entire day but we wanted that content available afterwards the next one we do is going to be even a broader mix so it's going to be over a few days but um much more on demand so think of like keynote live maybe a panel live and everything else on demand. So we can actually generate more content without people needing to, to sit first and foremost live through it. We're also gonna create um, mechanisms so the audience can then engage with the speakers in kind of novel and new ways. So think of these as like smaller round tables where you could join the speaker for lunch and maybe 15 people are invited so they can have like a more intimate conversation. So. We're really trying to do what a lot of people are doing is like, what have we learned that started as more traditional event? And now how do we move that into a world and into a place where it's much more interactive um, in a virtual setting? So that's kind of what we're going to experiment here in the next couple of months. But, you know, the teams, we, like anything, we're trying to innovate, be creative around um, the format because we don't want to keep doing the same thing we did in the past. Um, but the whole purpose is to provide the audience something of value. Um, 
that's what we do with the podcast as well. Is like we interview other data leaders on how they're driving change in our company. When we do an ebook, which we did one recently, the way, and I, I love this idea. This was like a idea of the team. Um, a woman on my team just said, so listen, I'm going to identify 20 leaders and I'm going to go interview them and ask them for like best practice. And I'm going to take those best practices. I'm going to put them into a book and I'm going to give the book away. And that's what we did. And so again, it's using people's expertise because people want to provide value and be seen as an expert. So it's valuable to the person providing the advice and it's valuable to the audience because they're getting value out of that. And our only role in that is the person putting together and distributing it. And we're confident, like, you know, the, the bet is people will be like, oh, well, who's this company? We build awareness. It, and we're confident, like, if you check us out and we're right for you, then you're going to raise your hand and come talk to us. We don't need to ask you 10 times. Um, and that puts a lot of pressure on marketing to do the right thing. When somebody lands on your website, can you convert them? Are you creating urgency? Is the problem statement clear? Is the value providing unique? That puts a lot more pressure on marketing, but that's what that's what marketing's job is. <laughs> so. And, it, and uh, what I like is it takes away the pressure from the potential customer because then they're not spammed by a lot of uh, right. out, outreach that they don't need and like. It's like basically luring them with good content that adds value. And if they're ready, they can raise their hand and say, yeah, now I want to talk to someone. So if everybody would do that, um, the world would be a better place, I would say. <laughs> I would um, agree. I, in agree. Some I sense, mean, it, yeah. it does, it does um, you know, like I said before, it puts a lot more pressure on the marketing team to do things correctly and get really good at the things that they do. And But this to me all ties back to like, the brand that you're trying to create and the experience you're trying to create with prospects and customers. And, you know, if, if you've committed to this process, you got to follow it through because when you break that, you break the trust, right? So if we were to start spamming people now, um, you know, they would have a different perspective of who we are as a brand, as a company versus like what we're trying to create. Absolutely. And for most B2B companies, the target market is not infinite. It's like a set number of people, even if it's just a few thousand or sometimes even less. And if you burn through your target market and uh, like leaf ashes, you pick some low hanging fruits. Yeah, you get these 2% who have an urgent need right now, but the other 98% think, what the heck? I don't want to talk to anyone of narrative science. You're on my spam list now and I, I don't want to hear from you anymore. Correct. So um, th like, Taking the long view on this, I think that's, that's the change uh, a little bit also that I also see it with a lot of podcast guests that I have right now. So you're absolutely in line with a lot of what a lot of sales and marketing leaders are thinking right now. Um, that, that is a nice way to think about it to how, get, how do I get the most value in the next 10 years and not just in this quarter or this year. Yeah, and, and, what, I, uh, and what, I, what I would like, um, all the energy marketers put into like, capturing an MQL and nurturing it. They should put that energy into making my position and what I do distinct and differentiated. So what I mean by that, and you give them, you gave the stats before, like not a lot of people are in the market to buy what you have at any given time, even though one could argue everybody will need it at some point. The point is when they run across your brand, are you saying anything of, of interest that hooks them to be like, yeah, I have that problem. I need that. I've, you, how are you creating the urgency or is all your messaging and positioning super watered down and you're just depending on the ebook to do all the work for you. And so in this case, when we need people to raise their hand, we have to be sharp on our messaging, on our positioning, on the content we create just to pull out the people who are actually interested. Um, Cause we water that down. Like nobody, no, no matter what you do, nobody's going to raise their hand. And so, you know, things like copy and conversion rate optimization on your website and um, making sure you've targeted correctly in an ad and you've said something that's going to resonate with the people you wanted to resonate with. These are all things that I think marketers sometimes 
tend to overlook as commodities and they're anything but like that's the actual stuff that differentiates you mm -hmm. absolutely with you i mean i see it with with us with our company we help like smaller companies with up to i don't know 200 people maybe or 300 um to to build a human connection with their with their target market um and what we see a lot is when we help those companies and we call them immature sales organizations because they don't have someone responsible for marketing and sales and so it's it's more unconventional a little bit um they always first think about our product so i have to get my product that are in front of the person and we always do exactly what you you're doing for your company for a lot of different customers we always say ah stop a moment so who's your ideal customer first and they struggle a lot with that and once you have your ideal customer what kind of value can you bring to the table where you showcase that you are a thought leader in your area but maybe you 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 don't talk about your product or brand in the first few messages at least so that you build a personal relationship and someone says hey cassidy brings value to to this conversation and then you earn the right to at some point say hey if you have this problem there are some solutions out there you could do it this way and maybe in a, a, a in a message later you say and by the way we are also part of the solution if it's something you would like to know more, um, raise your hand. I mean, yeah. I'm sure that our playbook will evolve, but I, I'm happy that I, uh, that I think we are on the right track because uh, it's not only you saying it's, it's, it's the right way to go, to provide value first. I would like to add to this because this is something we've stressed a lot in our company, and that is our people as kind of the brand ambassadors and sharing kind of their knowledge and expertise, not talking about what, what we do. Mm -hmm. In this day and age, I think this is the competitive advantage of a small company in that if you're, if you started a small company, chances are you are a thought leader. Like you, you, you didn't like the status quo. You saw a better way for the future and you've built something, a product or a service to do that. You need to go evangelize that. What's interesting, if you watch LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, like you don't see big companies doing this. No, not at all. Companies yeah. that people can't do this. And so this is why I think the opportunity is for a small company, whereas people are buying narrative science. They're buying just Lexio from narrative science. They're buying the relationship with everybody in the company. And we want them to feel confident that we have the, you know, the smartest people, the people who care about like what we're trying to solve that are mission driven, that are here for the customer, like that they're, they're buying the vision. They're not buying the product at any point in time or the service at any point in time, you're buying the relationship. And so this is why I think small companies have an opportunity to do when it comes to like talking about like a better world. And in fact, I'll, I, I won't work with any agency now if I don't, if I don't see the leaders of that agency, like talking about what they believe in online. Yeah. If, uh, like just full stop. I think it's a huge opportunity for agencies, like your people like yourself to be out there evangelizing, doing podcasts, these types of things. So I get to know you and those people before I do business with you. That's just the way the world's going to work going forward. Yeah, Probably it's always worked that way, but. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, it's like, I think there's like a pendulum. I always imagine it like a pendulum. So the good old days before the internet, it was human to human connection, you know, yeah. um, and then came the internet. So there was like the pendulum swinging into this mass spamming and it worked really well for a short amount of time. And now everybody's doing it. So it's not really working anymore or it's sometimes even hurting your brand. And now it's swinging back again, maybe not full, uh, but at least partly swinging back to, hey, uh, there are people behind those companies and there are people in my organization and how can I use both? And what you said, I like it a lot because that's exactly, I never said it this way, but that's exactly how it is. Um, these big companies have so many restrictions um, that sometimes employees who even wanted to, do, for example, use LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever to uh, to go out there and, and market themselves and, and their thought leadership and their company, they have to comply with so many things that they say, ah, no, I'd rather not do it. Or they're not, they're not even allowed to do it. So it's a great way to yeah to capture it. And once the big ones understand that they that, that that's something they missed out, it's almost too late. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting when you think about marketing and you're like, there's a lot of really interesting thought leaders on online that are sharing marketing tips and so forth. And they're often not at big companies. 
And there's reason, there's one or two reasons for that. One is the one you just said, like big company marketing leaders feel like they can't share. Or two, which may be more likely, is if you're a marketing leader in a big company, you're not innovative anymore. Like all the innovation is happening in small and medium-sized companies. And so the people who are the cutting edge and I would argue a lot of professions are going to be the people who are in smaller companies who have the grit and scratching and clawing and being different because they have to. Um, it's just an observation I've seen on like LinkedIn and Twitter over the last few months of like, where's all the big company marketers talking about all the cool stuff they're doing? And the reality is they're not doing many innovative things. No, they use their company profiles. Nobody looks at them and they don't use their, 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 their manpower, so to say. So you, you also have a podcast. What's the name of your podcast? Um, leading with data. And you're also the host. I am the host. Yes. <laughs> Why did you start a podcast? <laughs> well, I mean, we've been talking about it, uh, as a marketing team for a while and then, you know, COVID hit and we kind of threw everything that we we're thinking out the door and we said, we want to create a mechanism online where we can have conversations with interesting people in, in our industry. And so we started this as a video cast. It was actually a YouTube video series. And we started that like probably weeks after COVID started. And then, um, in, you know, sometime in October, we flipped it also into a podcast. And we did that because we wanted to increase in distribution. We, we found that it was working. We're getting in a good rhythm. We're like, oh, this is valuable. Let's broaden the distribution. We turn it into a podcast. And I actually just posted about this on LinkedIn, I think yesterday, like the reason I'm the host is because, because I'm the head of marketing and my team came to me and said, listen, we're a small company. Whether you like it or not, you have to be the host. <laughs> and I'm like, I never had an aspiration to host a podcast, but they were right. Like sometimes in a small company, you got to be the person who does these things and leads by example. So I've learned to actually, I like it a lot. Now I, now it's one of the most fun things I do in my job but it wasn't always the case at the beginning. I was like, are you serious? Like, why am I doing this? Um, but it's great. I wouldn't change it for the world. And so what, we do, you, to... what do you love it now personally? Yeah. So I, uh, it's funny, Mitch, I, uh, what did I say in my post yesterday? Um, it, um, so a few things like one, I'm just a curious person. So I love learning about like what other people are doing to drive change. And this, this is a great outlet to ask questions and kind of just learn. Um, it, it kind of scratches the itch for being creative. So like the higher up you go as a marketer, the less I get to create stuff. My team is great at creating things and I'm hopefully good at allowing them to do that and getting out of their way. And this provides me an avenue where I can actually, you know, do something creative as an outlet. Um, it's kind of like anything you do in life chess or golf or whatever, you're never going to be good enough. You always want to get better. So like, this is something you can, you know, every episode you can learn something new and get better at the next time, whether it's the right question or what have you. And so I like that, that continuous improvement feel. Um, and I think third for marketers, like we're always looking for avenues to talk to people in the industry. And what I love about the digital world is like that barrier is a lot lower. Just go on LinkedIn and have conversations or have a round table or a virtual event and like lead that or have a podcast and get on and ask people to come be guests and talk to them about what they've learned and kind of their career and how they can provide value to others versus like always talking about your product. So um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Like we don't look at it as uh, like this is something that we expect to be a direct lead generator, but we see it as an opportunity for us to engage and get back to the industry. And if we do that right, then the rest will take care of itself. So people out there, start your own podcast. I can absolutely agree with everything you said. It's a lot of fun. And after the first one, two sessions, you get better and better. Uh, there are big jumps, I can tell you. <laughs> I don't want to listen to my first podcast, but... <laughs> It's, it's really funny good. you say that. Like the hardest thing to get used, one of the hardest things for me to get used to is actually listening to myself speak. You know, afterwards I go back. I just I always wanted to listen to hear what the other person said so I could remember it. But then I but I have to listen to yourself, and I'm like, oh, get over that part though. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I don't think I don't think anybody really likes that, except you are like um, uh, a, uh, a singer or something. <laughs> That's true. So we are already at the finish now, Cassidy. Do we still have time for five rapid fire questions? Yeah, let's do it. Let's okay. Do it. What do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? So uh, um, there's two things I'm, I, I like doing. One is I like CrossFit, if people know what CrossFit is. And then two, I, I do go jogging when the weather's decent. Um, so given that we're in COVID and I can't go to the gym, I've built one in my garage. So I've bought a pull-up bar. I've bought barbells and weights. I have, you know, so I basically do CrossFit in my gym, even though it's 40 to 50 degrees out or in my gym, in the garage. And so it's very Spartan-like. It's not very nice, but it gets the job done. And, you know, I make sure I do that every day um, or go for a run. And part of that's to stay healthy, uh, as I get older for my kids, but because there's no other, the other part is, is just mentally is helpful for me because there's not a lot of other outlets you have um, right now. So this is kind of a, call it my meditation um, for a lack of a better word. I absolutely understand what you're doing. I do the same, different sport, but uh, same <laughs> attitude. Um, your favorite business book? I like a lot of the classics, but there's one that that's really been, that's really shaped our marketing direction at Narrative Science. And that's a book called Play Bigger. Play Bigger is the first book I've seen that kind of outlined how to do what I call category design or what they call category design. And that is, um, you know, really, it's another form of saying like, how do you position yourself in your market to be unique and different? And in the past, I, I love like uh, Jack Trout and Al Reese when they talk like positioning, they throw some classic books on positioning. Um, Crossing the Chasm I mentioned earlier. These were always, these are like these books I go back to that are foundational to marketing. And I feel like Play Bigger is like a foundational book for marketers in kind of this generation. Um, so I highly recommend it. And one of the authors is a guy named Christopher Lockheed, and he's got a couple of podcasts out there that I think are some of the best marketing podcasts um, going right now. So read the book, check out Christopher. Um, he can learn a lot as a marketer. Mm -hmm. Great. Favorite business leader you follow? Ah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, they kind of come in two camps. Like there's the camp of like the really big well-known names. Like you got to admire people like Jeff Bezos and obviously see jobs before he passed away. And, you know, the other leaders of, you know, Google, Microsoft. So obviously you pay attention from afar to what they do. And anytime they say something or you hear them on a podcast or they write a book, you read it. But more day to day, it's, um, it's a lot of people that other people follow. I think, like Dave Gerhardt, I think has done a lot for marketing function. He used to be the CMO at Drift and he's got his own community he's built on Facebook. And um, yeah, it's gone, in some ways it's gone really commercial, but I think I admire what he's done for the, the profession of B2B marketing. And he's really helped a lot of marketers out there kind of rethink the role and opportunity of marketing and the impact that you can have. And so Christopher Lockheed, Lockhead would be another one, play bigger. I, these are people that it's, it's kind of much more near and dear to like, what do I do and how do I drive change in my company? I look for those types of people who can help me day in and day out, um, kind of on a more tactical or micro level. Mm -hmm. Not a great answer. It's, it's not like I got one person who inspires. No, me no, here. I like it. There's no good or bad answer. It's what what you follow, what you like, and that's what I ask for. So yeah. absolutely good answer, Cassidy. <laughs> um, who should be our next podcast guest? Yeah, I was thinking about this one. Uh, I'll give you two people. Um, like you don't become, you know, I don't go on these podcasts as a marketer without really good people on my team. So there's there's two people I'd recommend. There's a woman named Anna Walsh on my team who's um who's 
she's a woman who runs kind of growth for us and before that product marketing, but she's a, just a really good leader early in her career. She does a fabulous job with her team. She does a fabulous job mentoring other young leaders in our company. And, um, you know, truly kind of phenomenal person. So I think when it comes to like how to take charge of your career, when you're, you know, in your twenties and how to make a difference and impact and how to influence, um, she, she'd have a lot to share to like a, for a young, younger audience as well as, a, you know, people like myself looking for talent and marketing. And then the other one I would say is a woman I worked with, I haven't worked with for a while, but she's in Europe. She's lives in France and she's British. Uh, and her name is Sue White. And I'm happy to recommend, uh, introduce you to her, uh, the best product marketer, one of the best marketers and probably the best product marketer I've ever worked with. Um, and so, you know, early in my career, when I got into marketing, I wasn't always a marketer. And it was people like Sue who really made us successful in what we're doing because she's so good at her job and she's just an awesome human being as well. So um, if you're looking for somebody in Europe who has a strong marketing background, I would highly recommend Sue and I'm happy to put you in touch with her. Awesome. Thanks a lot for both tips. I will get back to you. And uh, now you can directly address our audience, anything they can help you with. Yeah, there's two things that I was, that would be helpful is go check out what we do mm -hmm. and uh, reach out to me in, in, with, with two pieces of feedback. What is something that you saw that you thought was good that we should do more of? And what is something that you think we didn't, we aren't doing well enough that we could improve? And so um, we love getting kind of critical feedback as a company. That's part of our culture is being honest and open about things we do well and things that we don't do well. And so, um, what would be great is if people took the time to kind of give us that feedback, um, specifically the things that we could improve and mm -hmm. what you see as far as how we, what you can see in the market as far as like what we do as a company and how we position ourselves and the things that we do as a marketing organization. I put your, uh, the link to your website in the show notes. Perfect. And, and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's the mm -hmm. easy. I spent a lot of time on LinkedIn. You can send me an email at C shield. So C S H I E L D at narrative science.com. Um, either way, happy to talk to anybody who wants to reach out and talk marketing or ask for advice and how I can help. Awesome. It was a, ples a pleasure, a real, real pleasure to have you on our show. I learned a lot and it was fun. That's always good. So thank you so much for being our guest. Cassidy. Well, thanks for inviting me, Sammy. It was a lot of fun and I'm honored to be on your show and look forward to watching your success. Thanks a lot. Bye. See ya.